Every morning I fight the rush hour, just like anyone else who works for a living in this crazy town. Like you, I get uptight sometimes, banged around by the crunch and the pressure of the city, and the rest of life's irritations and disappointments. As with so many people my age, late 20s, early 30s, I've tried a number of things to unwind from the tension. About six months ago, I got into something called yoga. And recently, I found a teacher who made sense to me. His name is Swami Satchidananda, and he runs a place called the Integral Yoga Institute. Swamiji, to most people, mm -hmm. yoga seems to be a, a curiosity, or at mm -hmm. best, strange sounds and rather strange-looking postures mm -hmm. of the body. Mm -hmm. Why should the average working person in New York or anywhere else really care about yoga? Well, of course, it is strange to most of the Westerners because they haven't seen such uh, curious poses or chanting, because most of the chantings are done in Sanskrit language. Uh, it is curious, but when they come closer and they, when they find out the purpose of all, they seem to be more interested in it, and the curiosity becomes an interest. Well, what's in yoga for, say, the average working New Yorker? Well, uh, to simpl simplify the purpose of yoga is to just keep a healthy body and a relaxed, peaceful mind, relieving the tension of the body and mind, and to keep you always uh, healthy and happy. That is the simplest answer, I should say, because once the body is in good shape and the mind is sound and peaceful, then you become a perfect instrument uh, for a higher force to work through. If something is well focused camera and a powerful lens and a very sensitive film inside means it is ready to catch any image. So you become a good instrument, a re recipient for the higher force. Swami Satchidananda came to the United States from India and Ceylon in 1966. Although he only planned a two-day visit to the city, he stayed, attracted students, and ultimately built one of the largest yoga schools in the Western world, with 20 branches in Europe and North America, and tens of thousands of pupils in the United States alone. Although there are literally scores of genuine yoga teachers and a smaller number of gurus or Eastern spiritual guides in America today, Satchidananda remains the best known. His integral yoga institutes, of which there are two in Manhattan, not only teach the physical postures of yoga and methods of meditation, but they also provide yoga teachers to prisons, drug rehabilitation centers, schools, and colleges, since yoga, as taught by Satchidananda, is supposed to be a means of serving God through serving people. Satchidananda's fame in New York and elsewhere stems in part from his activism within the circle of religious leaders. In 1966, he met with Pope Paul, and again in 1970. The Swami, along with clergymen of the Jewish, Buddhist, and Catholic faiths, directs an ecumenical organization called the Center for Spiritual Studies in New York. Since his arrival in New York in the mid-60s, Swami Satchidananda has been very popular with the counterculture. And back in 1969, he officiated at the opening of the Woodstock Music Festival. Swami Satchidananda is 58 years old. He has recently returned from a round-the-world tour of spiritual centers. 
what a joy you take when you say, I am unlimited. Huh? At least for the sake of experiencing that joy, say, I am unlimited, I am universal. <laughs> Even to say that, how beautiful it is. He said, oh, I belong to this country, only to this country. Oh, so you, you don't belong to Europe? No, that's not my And not to India? No, that's not my Not to Australia? Oh, that's not my country. Philippines? Oh, I could never even think of it. <laughs> <laughs> that means you got bottled up in one place. Hmm? The same way, if you possess one house, this is my house. That one, not mine. This one, no, not at all. The other one, oh, not mine. How many times do you have to say, not mine, not mine, because he has said only to one place, mine. See? Because you say, this is mine, you may have to say, this is not mine, that's not mine, that's not mine, hundred. Are you a gainer or a loser then? Even business sake, I say, the minute you possess one thing, you lose many other things. <laughs> Instead, say, everything is mine. <laughs> or if you are afraid of somebody saying something, no, no, that can't be yours, then say, okay, nothing is mine. Why? Because I came with nothing, I'm going to go with nothing. Huh? Either this way or that way. Huh? When you came into your mama's womb, you didn't even have the body. Huh? Is it not so? It's the mama who gave you the body. Huh? She ate a lot, huh? all calcium, iodine, <laughs> iron, this and that. She gave a little of her blood, huh? her calcium. She built a body for you. When you came in, you didn't even have a body. And that's why when you go, you leave the body to the big mother and go away. Mother Earth. Huh? The graveyard is the womb of the Mother Earth. Huh? You leave the body here because you got it, you leave it. Huh? You just go as you came. You came as, an, as a part of energy and you walk out as an energy. That's why even when somebody is dead, you say, Oh, where is he? Oh, I, I, he was here last year. Where is he? Oh, don't you know? He is dead and gone. <laughs> he is dead and gone. So we, we have no right to possess anything. We have every right to use. If we think in this terms, we will never get limited by these things. We become unlimited, universal. That is the kingdom of God. What were you doing before you met Swamiji? Well, I uh, finished school. I was a, uh, a major in uh, French literature, four years of college. But at the end, I was really not happy with myself at all. And in a way, I dropped out after I finished college and came here to New York more or less just to live. I was really unhappy with my experience here and uh, in trying to pull myself together, trying to make some sense of what I wanted to do in my life, I heard about Swamiji and I began to come to lectures and classes and things like that. What's working with Swami Satchidananda been like for you? It's been a, and still is, a tremendous growing experience in a time of really constant constant re-evaluation of myself, what the meaning of my life is, what I want to do with it. In a way, uh, Swamiji has really helped me to develop, to know myself better in uh, countless numbers of ways. As I became more and more familiar with the Institute, I took on more and more responsibilities here. And of course, taking responsibility on yourself brings out things that you normally might not bring out. It kind of puts you to the test. And in doing that, in trying to help other people, to serve the people here, uh, slowly learning to improve myself, to feel more free, more open, more relaxed, uh, to be more useful to people in general. <laughs> Thank you.
Bungie, the people who live in and around New York City, the adults, mm -hmm. are known throughout the world as being a, a skeptical lot. Yes. Because there are so many people living in such a small space and so much money changes hands in this yes. part of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, New Yorkers are pretty wary about anything that smacks of a promise of happiness and health. Mm -hmm. Can you give people who are listening to you now uh, some sort of an idea in words as to why they personally might take another look at yoga? Or maybe a first look. Yes. Because in yoga, we don't say that yoga is going to bring you happiness. Instead, we say, happiness is in you always. Nothing can give you happiness. If anything gives happiness, you will lose it one day. Because anything that comes will go away. But in yoga, you say, it is you always. You are by nature happy and healthy. Or in other words, so when you call yourself disease, what do you mean you have lost your ease? You are at ease, when that ease gets disturbed, you call yourself disease. So this is your nature to be at ease. That's why when you are at ease, you don't complain, you don't go to a doctor. Only when you lose that ease, then you want a doctor. The same way when you are peaceful, you don't complain. When you lose the peace, you complain. So yoga says, retain your ease and peace. See, whatever disturbs your ease and peace, find out that and stay away from it. It's the simplest way. There is no peculiar uh, approach in it. It is the plain truth. Anything that will disturb your ease and peace, stay away from it. So it makes sense to people. We don't guarantee that, come on, swallow this pill or do this, you'll get happy, you'll get healthy. We never do that. Even sometimes we see advertisements, smoke this cigarette, you'll be happy. I don't know, if cigarette is going to bring happiness, well, I would like to have tons of cigarettes. And unfortunately, I see people who smoke more cigarettes become unhappy. So we say, not even God can bring you happiness. Happiness is in you. And that is the God in you. So at all costs, retain it. That is a simple message of yoga. Now, by what method can someone who is listening to you and watching you now yes. begin to attain or retain, as you say, mm -hmm. what's inside them, this peace mm -hmm. and this happiness? The very first thing is to know what disturbs the peace. Analyze it. We begin with the gross body. First find out why, what causes the tension. In the human body. In the human body. Mostly, of course, the mental tension is relied onto the body also. And at the same time, you are very living. The, the, the food that you eat, the liquids that you drink, the air that you breathe. Hmm? And you're speaking in New York City where the, the food that people eat uh, involves junk hot dogs, junk pizza. So then, uh, so, we say, take care of that, then you are free from toxins. Then, probably you might say, what am I to do with the already put in toxins? See? I will say, it's already prevention, but it's already saturated with toxins, what am I to do? For that we say, come and do some forces, exercises, which we call the poison. They are not actually exercises, they are just different postures. By putting the body in different postures, you induce a mild pressure onto the very vital organs of the system, the glands, the nerve centers, and thus you give a gentle inner massage. And thus, slowly the toxins are disturbed. And then by your proper breathing, you burn it out. You eliminate the toxin. And by proper relaxing method, you again lose the tension to the body. If I were a 35-year-old New York City police officer, mm -hmm. why would you tell me that I should study yoga? What is the purpose of a police officer? The purpose of a police officer is to help the people both the good people and the bad people. Bad people 
to prevent them from committing crime, not just to punish them. The police means to help the criminals also, not to do the crime. And the other is not to get involved in it, and not to be affected by the criminal. So he is a real good neutral person. He should not have any hatred towards the criminal. The policeman must be a saintly person. And he needs a lot of presence of mind also. He should not be affected by the outside influences. He should not be prejudiced by the other people in easily. See, if he is going to be prejudiced by the people, if somebody looks like another person who committed a crime, immediately he will look this man also as a criminal. He may be an innocent man. So it is a policeman who needs a neutral eye, a clear vision, and a presence of mind under critical situations. He has to make quick decisions. In fact, in Ceylon, I was giving this yoga lessons in the police training force itself. The topmost person, the IGP, the Inspector General of Police himself, is a student of mine. He practices, his wife practices, and his children practice. Because of the benefit that he derived from this, he wanted me to teach this to the entire police force. The statistics say that the majority of the people in the world are Christian, followers of Christ. That means all those people, mostly the Western country, Western side is following Christ. And almost all the wars begin in the West. All the massacres, even in the name of God, start in the West. Are we really following Christ then? In the name of Christ, can we, can we even raise our hand to kill somebody, shoot somebody, throw bomb at somebody? For any reason, political reason or uh, religious reason? Then there's something wrong with our approach. Nothing wrong with Christ and Christianity. If the majority of the people are doing this, then what about the minority? Then the same. Hindus, Muslims killing each other. Even among Buddhism, the Hinayana, Mahayana, Theravata, Hinavata, yeah? killing each other. Among Islam religion, the Sufi, one side, the other one, one side, everywhere. They're all ego tricks. Swamiji, if there's any one problem in the city of New York today that mm -hmm. touches virtually every life, it's the, the growth, uh, incredible growth every day of the heroin crisis. Yes. We've got uh, an, an increased murder rate over last year that's mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. horrendous mm -hmm. all by itself. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it apparently is directly mm -hmm. attributable to drugs. Mm -hmm. We have a solution to this for people in the city, an approach. Well, I could say that if those addicts are treated properly, mentally, not only physically. See, many of the people who come here, they are addicts in some way or other. We not only treat the physical side, but we treat the mind also. Keep the mind occupied in the proper thing. Keep the mind relaxed. And then they won't think of heroin. And another aspect is the addiction is caused by the previous drug that has been taken in. Take for example smoking. Why a man craves to smoke more and more? Because he has the nicotine that is already put in by his previous smoking. Consciously he doesn't want to smoke, but unconsciously he wants it. What is it unconscious want? What creates that want, which you call craving, is the nicotine that is already in him. Until and unless the nicotine is eliminated from his system, he can't stop smoking. However much he tries, unless he is a man of great willpower. So here we say, one side we educate the mind, other side we try to eliminate the toxin, the nicotine that is already put in. 
the same way the, every drug has some deposit in the system it is to be eliminated that is why we give physical postures breathing and even to ease the mind meditation some chanting and talking a lot to them and keeping themselves occupied in something more useful and concrete and keeping them away from the same old company self analysis analyze yourself ko hum who am i keep on asking ko hum ko hum ko who hum i who am i is that me is this me na hum not me because this is mine not me is it not my hand is hurting not me my hand <laughs> my finger pricked my eyes my finger pricked my eyes i didn't prick me is my finger my eyes and so my mind is disturbed eh <laughs> see it's all third person your object your hand pricked your eye and so your mind is disturbed why should you worry <laughs> how is upan first met swami sachidananda back in 1966 swami ji had recently arrived how is upan was spending most of his time on the street doing drugs i was very much involved with drugs and a very sort of hedonistic approach to life you know only trying to i uh, sort of misinterpreting the idea of living for the day only uh and not sort of leading my life in any particular direction not having any goal fixed in mind so consequently i was doing all kinds of things that were damaging like taking drugs every day smoking marijuana every day taking LSD regularly i had the idea then that that was going to bring me some type of enlightenment or some type of um expansion of my consciousness in a way it did open me up a little more than i was but that was i guess just an indication of how close i was at the time uh because after meeting swami ji i began to understand a whole new sphere of reality that existed a whole new way of relating to people a different type of capacity to respect and love people that i didn't know existed before uh consequently i wasn't that i felt i had to stop taking drugs i just sort of left them left them behind i started practicing the yoga postures on a daily basis started getting my body in shape as i left the drugs behind i also left behind eating meat and that also increased my feeling of health and vitality my everyday existence i began to look forward to waking up in the morning you know the night couldn't end fast enough so i could get on my feet and start my day's activities right in the beginning i had a tremendous surge of energy and it brought me to a new energy level a new feeling of joy in life that i haven't settled down from of course since that time i've begun to understand that the spiritual path is and all just joy and bliss i smoke marijuana and find that it helps me should i stop smoking why if it helps you <laughs> 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 if it helps you do it <laughs> but what do you think help may not be real help hmm? scratching and it helps you hmm? if you ever had it start scratching it helps you keep on once you take the fingers out it will itch more if you keep on scratching it will burn and bleed so if it itches don't even touch it it will go away so don't think that what you think help is always help so if it really helps you fine what kind of help i want to know people say spiritual experience 
If you are going to get spiritual experience out of your grass, it's not a natural experience. It is not organic experience. Hmm? It's chemically grown experience. Even your food, we don't want to be grown chemically. Your vegetable, potato, tomato must be organic. Don't you want to be organic then? Swamiji, with the influx mm -hmm. of spiritual leaders from India and other parts of the East, mm -hmm. how are New Yorkers and other Westerners to know the real from the fake? Well, it's difficult to know unless uh, one goes and experiences themselves. But there are certain major qualifications which you can see. See, a genuine man will not go out of the way to publicize himself. He is not a businessman. And he won't guarantee this and that. He will just be very simple and say, I won't promise you anything. You try and if you are benefited, fine. And he won't do it as a commercial thing. He won't be charging a lot for this. See, even in our institutions, we just expect a dollar donation for every class. Whereas I know there are people for each class, sometimes five dollar, ten dollar, twenty-five dollars each class they charge. There are people like that. So we don't make it as a we do it as a service. So from that one can judge. So you've been in New York mm -hmm. off and on as a resident in the metropolitan area for a little better than six years now. Yes. Are we going under into the Atlantic Ocean spiritually, or do, we, do you think we have a chance as a city? We have a chance. We have a chance. You know, because the present generation is really genuinely interested in that. Only thing is, they don't seem to know the proper way. They are running here and there to catch up something. The only thing is that quite natural with the Western world and mainly with the New York world, they just want everything to happen instantaneously. Just like your instant coffee and tea, they want instant samadhi. There comes the trouble. That is why I don't guarantee any time limit. Instant bliss. No instant <laughs> bliss. No instant samadhi. And uh, first they try all the instant methods. When everything fails, then they come to me and they stick on. Until then I don't force them to come. 